So I'm at CEDIA 2023 and I'm very pleased and proud to be at the Mad VR stand and even more so with Richard Litovsky. Absolute pleasure to finally meet you in person after all these years. Thank you for Thanks, all your Richard. support, Andrew. We're here to talk about Mad VR, but specifically about motion AI. But before we do, I'd really like to know what drove you to produce and develop Mad VR. Give us a few seconds on that. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it. So, you know, I'm a, at heart a DIY enthusiast, and um, I have built my midlife crisis home theater over a course of three years. Uh, it was a very grueling process, and at the end of it, I was very happy with. The room was comfortable, it looked great, the screen was great, you know, the audio was amazing, but the video left me wanting more. And I was looking around the market for options and I decided it would be best to create my own video processor, the video processor that I wanted for this pinnacle room that, you know, that, that I had set out to, to achieve. Mm. And so I knew of my uh, partner Matthias's great work um, in the in the world of video processing, I reached out to him and introduced myself. I explained that I was a serial entrepreneur and that uh, I had done this type of thing before creating businesses, and that uh, we should team up together. And he should kind of you know he's in Germany, I'm in the U.S. And we decided, hey, let's put our resources. Each of us do what we do best, and he handled the technical side, and I handled the business side, and. Here we are about five years later with the product in nearly a dozen uh, setups here throughout Cedia. That's great. We've been really proud to be involved with Maviar from relatively early days, obviously with the Mark I. And, uh, you know, we were excited with the capabilities. As you know, we produced a video on aspect ratio. We've been trying to shoot a video on the motion interpolation, but we're str struggling with that. So hopefully today we can set that straight because we want all of our viewers and all of the Mad VR fans to see see what capability there is in this motion interpolation. Yeah, sure. So uh, first, just a little bit of history, okay? Um, so today's technologies and displays run on sample and hold. And it's not a really complicated sounding thing. I think it probably should be maybe called display and hold. It's a little bit more intuitive, I think, for people that aren't familiar with it to understand, but all modern day displays, whether it's OLED, Alcos, LCD, SXRD, you know, they all are using sample and hold, DLP as well. Um, DLP is not as effective because of how fast uh, it operates. Um, but sample and hold is essentially, when you watch the movie, there's 24 frames per second. The video is flashed on the screen and it's held in its full state until the next frame is ready. Mm. And then 1 24th of a second later, the next frame appears out of nowhere. There's no visual break. So it's something called persistence of vision. And this creates a blur effect when the frame jumps in your mind. Because think about real life, right? If we're watching something, if this is spinning, mm. and we're watching something, it's here, and 1 24th of a second later, it's here, okay? Imagine in real life if everything just instantly teleported. Oh, it's a bit like to this, a new right? Spot. The, yeah. Yeah, I mean, our, our eyes and brain aren't used to seeing that. It's not how real life works. So the fact that where there's no visual break and something jumps from one spot to another creates, our brain wants to kind of connect the dots and it creates this perceived blur. Okay, and this is something that affects all sample and hold displays, not DLP as much. Okay, now if you look to the older days, you go back to traditional film, and traditional film has the black bar right in between each frame. So as it goes, you're going like this, and the next one like this. That breaks up that visual field. And same thing, uh, plasma and CRT also worked in a way where effectively the image flashed and then faded before the next one came. Flash and then faded, so it didn't have that persisted image. And so those technologies didn't suffer from the motion blur, and so this is the type of thing, motion AI, there's a reason why motion AI was invented in the first place. Most people will roll their eyes when they hear about motion AI, and they say, oh, you mean that thing on the TV? that we all turn off first thing we get, right? And it's a reason because the implementation hasn't really hit the nail on the head, mm. right? It's either adds its own artifacts mm. or it's too strong or too weak. You know, imagine that these things have off, low, and high, right? So imagine having to take a shower where you set your temperature at cold, warm, or hot. Mm. 
right? You're not gonna find that spot and you might be like, I don't like that shower, I don't like that. I'm just not gonna use that and that's effectively what happens. But what if you could invent the world's first AI-based motion interpolation designed to handle both of those things, to pro provide artifacts, reduction, it's not gonna be perfect, but to reduce the amount of artifacts that these systems traditionally add as well as give that fine grain control to set, in our analogy, to set that temperature of the water exactly where you want it. And that's what we set out to do. And just by doing that, you can use a light application. We see, we say use Motion AI responsibly, meaning don't go crazy unless you really happen to love it, super ultra realistic. You can just use it on a low mode, like most of the theaters, including this Trino theater behind us, um, is using it in a low mode. And you can just use it just enough of it to counteract that sample hole blur effect while keeping it looking perfectly cinematic. So with that said, why don't we take a look at some footage? Okay, so what you're about to do is sort of walk us through some of the motion AI on the TV. We'll try and capture that as best we can. And uh, you know, when we're processing and editing this video, we'll do our best to show motion AI. One of the issues with motion AI, of course, and we've tried uh, I don't know if Richard knows this, I think I've tried about 12 times to shoot this video in our um, demonstration rooms and the frame rates and the cameras have been really challenging. But, you know, we'll try and explain the concepts and hopefully it comes across. Great. Um, so what we're looking at here is a scene in Baby Driver. And in Baby Driver what you're going to see is the windows. Just pay attention to the windows during this pan. So you can see here, the windows have all that Judder, yeah. Judder and blur, right? The blur is affecting the whole scene. Okay, now the pan's oh, wow. back. Yeah. You can see that as well. Yep. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna back up. And now I'm gonna use it on the highest setting, just to, so you can have an idea of how that looks. Oh. So now as it goes back and forth, you can see perfect, perfectly smooth. Right, and it's just, this I'm showing this not because we advocate using it this high. In fact, I think that in this scene, for this type of movie, it doesn't do the film justice, right? It's there to kind of give it perspective. But let's put it on low now. And putting it on low, now you can see it still preserves that cinematic look, and you still have the judder, and you still have some blur, but it's now it's controlled. As right. opposed to, as you said, the binary on or off or... Right. Yep. Now, let's go back. Because some, some people will say, we could show this with motion AI on low, and no one even realizes it's running. And so people will then say, well, because we'll do the demo, and it'll be on low. And they'll say, well, when are you going to turn it on? Say, oh, it's on already, it's just on low. And then the next question is, well, if I can't tell that it's on, then how effective is it actually in yep. controlling the scene? Yep. That's the beauty of the solution, right? We want it to be transparent. We don't want to change the nature of the film. We want to preserve director's intent and make it look cinematic. And that's why this we be able to achieve this in a low mode, right? So now I'm going to go ahead. This time, I'm going to split the screen, okay? It's going to be off on the right and on on the left. And as it goes through, you can see now the difference. So if you wonder like how much is low even helping since I can't notice really anything different mm. on its own, this puts it in perspective. So you'll see the instability on the right get cleaned up on the left as it passes through the magic line in the middle of the screen. It's just a little bit more controlled, stable, while still retaining that cinematic look. So this is really interesting. I was talking with Aaron last night and we were talking about how motion should look and this, this whole film look and the discussion over uh, the difference between film and, and the, the black uh, insert that we get in cinema and what we get on TV and the kind of harshness of, of uh, digital content perhaps. So this, I guess what you're saying to us, and correct me if I'm wrong here, is that what this is doing is, uh, this is taking us back to the cinema look. Because I guess one of the criticisms is, well, if you turn motion AI on, you're not working with director's intent. But in fact, if we look at the film technology and we look at the current processing of video, we've sort of crossed away from director's intent into this harshness, and, and you're trying to bring it back to 
how it looks in the cinema. Am I? It's, it's, you nailed it perfectly. Okay. So if we go back to our discussion about sample and hold and modern displays. Yes, yeah. Right, so these movies, director's intent, the directors are making these movies largely in mind with the big screen yeah. and commercial cinemas, yeah. right? And then we got to bring that at home. But, but they don't know what type of display it's going to be watched on yeah. and what kind of technology it has, right? And so people love the film look. We all treasure it, yeah. right? And that's you know, a choice that was made nearly 100 years ago for a combination of readings, reasons, yeah. both style, look, as well as economics, yeah. okay? The cost of film and being able to shoot in 24 versus 30 or other frame rates. You have to ask yourself and wonder if we were starting home, if we were starting cinema today, yep. would they pick 24 frames per second? You know, and, and would this become, you know, we're, this is what we're used to for film. So we want to try to preserve that look. And so this brings it full circle because if sample and hold technology is going to be adding blur and perhaps a little judder, then this can be used with the right amount of strength responsibly to just counteract that and give you that cinematic look like we just saw where it's controlled without being all over the place. I've been really confused by motion. So for example, 1917, that famous shed scene, I am convinced in my heart that when I watch it on our projector, it's not meant to look like it's all tearing apart. And I haven't seen it in a cinema on film, I'd like to, um, but I suspect that what this will do is it'll bring scenes like that back into the way they look in cinema. So, you know, that's I, the whole idea. Yeah, so I hope for the people watching this channel that you understand that this is not, a, you know, an attempt at departing from director's intent, but in fact, trying to bring the, the void between cinema and the digital delivery of content together. What we're saying now is that the current uh, technologies are perhaps not processing uh, material the way that that was therefore intended and 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 that's where we're going we're trying to get back to that point yeah right because you know some people might say oh I want to watch as a director intended I don't want to have any kind of motion yeah. handling yeah. but what if because of sample hold and modern day te display technology we're not seeing it the way the director intended. right yeah. because it's the display itself yeah can be introducing motion blur and a little bit of judder. Yeah. Right. And that's the whole idea yeah. behind yeah. why we brought motion AI to the market. It's not to try and change the look of film, mm -hmm. it's to try and preserve the look of film. And that's why we generally we recommend using it responsibly. Yeah. Right? Now, each is own. Right? Some people, and it also can be content dependent. If you're watching something like Planet Earth 2, you know, an amazing documentary where you have animals running through a jungle, maybe they want to use it at a stronger strength for that particular thing, and they want that ultra realism type of feel, and it may not need to look cinematic for them in that situation. So, but for the most part, using just a light amount of it. We've had many people uh, through dealers, as you can imagine, they're very passionate about film, have reached out to us during the process, and we've worked with them to make sure that they were in agreement that what we were delivering is the thing that would help preserve and deliver director's intent mm. to home cinema. Yeah. And we've been getting great feedback saying that used on low is like the perfect balance, including yeah. some big names in the industry. And, and also, as you said, you're giving people this sliding scale of choice. Clarify one thing for me as well. Um, obviously, there's a lot of intensive processing power in Motion AI. Which platforms, which, which of the MAB VR platforms, is Motion AI going to be available on? So Motion AI is available on the MV Extreme. Yeah. Both on the Mark One as well as the Mark II. Right, okay, cool. And um, is there anything coming in the future? Is there anything new that you can talk about? Or is that all just... Well, this is still pretty new, yep. um, but we actually have some really cool other AI algorithms yep. in development as well as some other things yep. that are going on that we'll be really excited and, to show you. And this hasn't been rolled out uh, fully yet, has it? Correct. So yep. um, I would say that probably 
I don't know, 50, 70 maybe of our dealers yep. that have reached out to us and want to have been involved yep. in this process have received Motion AI yep. throughout the process so yep. we could get their feedback and get their customers' feedback from the showroom and incorporate that into the development. Yep. Um, we're all through that phase right now. Uh, there's several theaters here, including the theater behind us, that are using Motion AI on low to deliver that. Yep. It's working flawlessly. The feedback's been fantastic. Yep. So we're really done with Gen 1 of Motion AI. And we actually have some really cool ideas that we're working on for Gen 2 Motion AI, and this is all going to be through software updates, yep. so you won't require some other hardware down the road to run like Gen 2 Motion AI, but That's there's right. some really interesting combinations of things that have never been done before yep. um, that we're working on. And on top of that, we're working on 24 to 48, um, which we actually just had built before this show. We didn't have time to roll it out here, as well as 50 to 100 and 60 to 120, which is going to be absolutely insane for sports, right? Because for sports, yeah. You want to get rid of all that motion blur. I know you guys love your football. We love our football. And a lot of people love both versions of football. So, um, you know, being able to see all that action and not have that blur in the ball. Because now, what content can you watch? You have a 4K uh, 120 display that's capable. What are you watching on there right now? Mm -hmm. Video games, playing video games, so it's great. But, you know, being able to take you know, sports out of your cable box or satellite TV and watch them at 4K 120 is really going to be game changing as well. That's fantastic. Look, we're very grateful to be involved with MavVR. We're very also, you know, appreciative of the fact that you've been very transparent with us. You know, we've worked closely for quite some time. You know, we, I, I help, I hope some of our feedback has helped with the product as well. Absolutely. Um, I am disappointed that I haven't been able to get a motion AI video out sooner. I have tried so hard, you have no idea. It's tricky to capture it on film. For I have sure. spent days on it. <laughs> but look, I, I'm very excited about it. We love the product and uh, I'm very, very pleased to be here. And thank you so much for your time. Oh, my pleasure. You guys are doing an amazing job. Thank you. Helping to educate the market yeah. and doing amazing work. Appreciate and it. We really appreciate your support. Thank right. you again for everything, Andrew. Cheers, Richard. Thank you. Cheers. See you later.